station. So Megan is, uh, when she's not at the BGC, she's a prof assistant professor of art history at Emory and faculty curator uh, at the Carlos Museum. I just want to say I think it's fantastic to have her here, not just because she's such a, a genial uh, and interesting intellectual presence, but also because the model of a person who is both a professor with a faculty line appointment and a uh, curator at the museum is a kind of professional model that's not so common uh, outside of the BGC, and so it's great for us and our students to see somebody who has this job in the real world, um, uh, and to see sort of how it's done and to get some sense of, of the way that works, and it's a possibility, so it's terrific that you're here. She uh, this is a specialist in the ancient Maya and other uh, ancient uh, American cultures, BA in archaeological studies from Yale and MA in history from Texas Austin, PhD in history of art from Yale. Uh, her first book, Engaging Ancient Maya Sculpture at uh, Piedras Negras in Guatemala, published by the University of Oklahoma Press. Uh, and then she uh, was at LACMA, Associate Curator of the Art of Ancient Americas, where she was curator of a number of exhibitions, including Revealing Creation, the Science and Art of Ancient Maya Ceramics, and Forces of Nature, Ancient Maya Arts uh, at LACMA, which is now touring in China. Is it still touring in China? Yes. Touring in China. Uh, and uh, at LACMA, she was the curator for City and Cosmos, the arts of Teotihuacan, and wrote for uh, LACMA's Found in Translation Design in California and Mexico in 1915 to 1985. So pretty big range. And she's here working on a book manuscript, The Lives of Ancient Maya Sculptures. Uh, and so it's great to turn the floor over to you. Yes, thank you so much. Um, I just want to thank you, Peter, and also Laura, and to all of you for this opportunity to be here. Uh, this is a project that I was working on a little while ago, a long time ago, but had to keep putting down because of other exhibition and book projects. Um, but it's the project that won't go away, that can't go away. That um, So to have the opportunity to work on it here, to have time, and to be in such a nice, uh, stimulating intellectual environment. I'm, very, very grateful, so thank you for that. Okay, so let's begin, and I did write the paper just to make sure that I stay on time, uh, but hopefully not too stiff. Um, so um, as Peter said, I'm here to work on this book in progress called The Lives of Ancient Maya Sculptures, and of course uh, with homage to Richard Davis's Lives of Indi Images in that uh, working title. Um, and so this book explores how ancient Maya people interacted with stone sculptures um, and changed them over time. And it's amid a larger inquiry into how the ancient Maya looked back to the past and reshaped it through images, text, and objects. So I want to introduce my research and give some examples of uh, to demonstrate the range of interactions with stone sculptures. Here you see one of them. And what they suggest about ancient monuments, their associations with portrayed individuals, and their use in reshaping the past or people's relationship to it. Um, so um, here is a map just showing with the stars uh, some of the sites that I am looking at um, in southern Mexico, Guatemala, and a little bit in Honduras, though I, the, the star is not there. Um, and it's um, how the ancient Maya um, engaged with these sculptures from the 4th to the 8th century CE. So their own engagements with their ancestors' sculptures. Though uh, some of the project I uh, won't show you today is also about modern engagements with these um, sculptures as well, um, including fragmentation, recarving, and restoration um, that was part of illicit looting or for museum display. Now, one prevalent sculptural type is the stela, called by the Maya lakamtun, or big stone. Vertically oriented monuments that frequently had a carved image of a ruler depicted alone or with family or court members. And here in the center is a ruler with his mother standing in front of him. These were installed in public locations in front of buildings and in plazas. 
and they appear to have been vital images of rulers and also displayed historical and political information about the rulers, ancestors, and the polity, showing continuity in rulership and legitimizing authority through ancestry or success in warfare. Now, in studying uh, these objects over time, I'm interested in acts that change the status of things and their materials, including making, dedication, breaking, and burial, and in the material evidence of those actions. I'm also interested in how they accrue meaning through individuals associated with them or actions that leave traces, <coughs> at times indelible on the thing. Now, we come to the monument after it's been marked by multiple engagements, and those material traces may lie beside, overlay, or even obliterate one another, creating a palimpsest of past interactions. And we may attempt, and we do try, to discern what happened chronologically, separating before from after, and even after that. Um, but they exist together in the present and constitute these things. For example, the Ombre de Tikal, or the Man of Tikal, was decapitated, its inscription partly obliterated, a new inscription added, a hole drilled in its back, and it was buried in a tomb. For Tikal Stila 31, carved faces were minimally chipped. You can see a little bit right here on the side. The monument was ripped from its base and erected in a shrine where there were fires um, and smashed ceramic offerings, and then it was buried. Pomona Stila 7 was smashed in warfare, recovered, and buried in a building. Now, these are the actions that we can see, but there were more that we cannot see, and we don't even have the missing pieces. So how do we then acknowledge and study the histories of these um, interaction when we can't see them all? And given our associated historical and archaeological data, we cannot reconstruct full, reconstruct full details from each moment. So it's a methodological <coughs> problem. Um, but what we can discern is the fundamental importance of engaging with these <coughs> monuments. Um, and as ways of reshaping the past and placing uh, oneself in relation to it. What we can also say is that some engagement would not have taken place without the earlier ones. For example, the rescue of fragments would not happen if enemies hadn't smashed the monuments. So thus the layering of interactions that we can see and that occlude the material record is not an accidental feature, but a fundamental aspect of those engagement histories, as much a part of their meaning as any individual one. So several years ago, I envisioned the organization of this book as one following a sculpture over time, from making to breaking and reuse. But this was a framework for comparing sculptures from about 10 archaeological sites. Not ambitious at all. Uh, that's why it's not finished yet, but it will be. Um, so that I could think about individual sculptures and also about widespread patterns. And I wrote separate chapters on enshrinement <coughs> and burial of sculptures and fragments. But the problem is that some fragments were only enshrined, others were only buried, and others were enshrined and then buried thus creating a repetition problem if divided by type of interaction. And when returning to the manuscript, I now want to highlight that layering of engagement as opposed to running scared from it. Um, so on screen are a few of the many sculptures in the chapters on enshrinement and burial. Of course, there are limitations of evidence and interpretation, for we don't have the dense historical informational context of later periods of art historical study that many of you work on. But we do have abundant material and archaeological evidence that can be correlated with information from images and inscriptions. Now, I've toyed with different ways of, of theorizing this material, one being about the materiality of memory 
or material markers of memory to conceptualize marks on a monument <coughs> that signal that something happened to it, that there was a before and after, as the pecking on this sculpture's face, you can see right here, indicates. And works by Yash Elsner and Charles Hedrick have been invaluable in these theorizations. Now another concept I'm weighing is historical materiality. I don't know yet if that's the right phrase. Um, but what I mean is a sense that a thing is connected to a moment or individual from the past and that sculptures remain associated with the individuals who dedicated them or were portrayed on them. And I'm building this framework by considering four diverse but complementary bodies of information. Conceptions of time, objects of time or for time, and images of time in support of understanding objects over time. So let me explain. So to understand objects over time, we have to contextualize them within ancient Maya calendars and conceptions of time, including the long count, the calendar round, and other calendar systems used to record events that could be distinguished from one another over long spans of time, say generations of historical dynasts, um, and Maya inscriptions precisely record events recounting the before and after. For example, a ruler's accession date that is 19 years, five months, and six days after his birth, with many inscriptions that say things like that. Or they use the calendar to create connections with ancestors by performing actions on calendar anniversaries of dates of important past events to bring people and episodes from the past back in memory. So for example, on this wonderful wooden lintel, number three, from Tikal Temple <coughs> 1, um, from 695 CE, um, the ruler Hasao Chankawil, who's uh, sitting here, um, uh, celebrates a victory on a date coinciding with the 260 year anniversary of the death of an important ancestor. Maybe too much information, but that's the kind of calendrical detail that we have, that this was important. Um, renewing the memory of that ancestor was significant to renewing the polity after a period of defeat and a decline of over a century. Now, uh, number two is this conception of objects of time or for time. Um, through name tagging or dedication statements, in which artists inscribed things with statements about what the object is, whether lakam tun, big stone, ukib, drinking vessel, just this one up here, and there's the glyph for ukib, or tup, ear spool, there's the glyph for tup, um, incised there. Um, and they can also include the dedication date or who, or made, who um, dedicated it or made it. And these decipherments have been made by people like Peter Matthews, Stephen Houston, Carl Taube, and David Stewart. Now these discoveries that ancient artists inscribed this information on objects highlighted the ancient importance attributed <coughs> to the naming and ceremonial dedication of things. Now, on Tikal Stila 31, which you'll see again and again today, um, over on this part of the monument, there is a long calendrical text marking the date that the ruler, Sia Chankawil, uh, dedicated the monument for a calendar ending in 445 CE. And many sculptures in my study and for, uh, in my uh, uh, in our corpus, were dedicated to mark the end of calendrical periods, commemorating New Year's and demonstrating the continuity of rulership and the performance of ceremonial rites on those dates. And this information was available to those who later encountered the monuments. They were thus made for time and were marked in time. And Stila 31, you have this very long text, um, and other monuments also recount 
ancestors' commemorations of earlier calendrical end endings, emphasizing that continuity in the marking of time. Now, the third uh, body of information that I want to bring up is ancient Maya images of time. And here is where we have portrayals of individuals or events from the past um, that are signaled by anachronistic or historic costumes or artistic styles designating difference. Sometimes vague, but other times specific, with inscriptions clarifying a particular person or event. Um, for example, on uh, La Corona panel six, Two women face each other. Here's one, and here's the other, and you can see them in the drawing. Um, and they're facing each other as if taking part in an event together. But the text reveals that they are from different <coughs> centuries. Both women came to La Corona, its ancient name was Saknite from uh, the Kanul dynasty as foreign princesses who married local lords. But one was in the sixth century and the other in the eighth. Aspects of their costuming and the architectural litters in which they stand signal that temporal difference. The eighth century queen on the left over here uh, wears contemporary Maya garb uh, amid aspects of Maya religion and iconography. But the 6th century queen on the right is surrounded by imagery from the central Mexican city of Teotihuacan, which had expanded to the Maya region in the 4th and 5th centuries, but tragically, and a big fire fell in the late 6th century. And it's, this is one of the examples in which Maya artists used Teotihuacan artistic styles and costumes to signal people and events from the Maya past, emphasizing the importance of particular ancestors or past events and to connect contemporary people with a historical legacy. Now, the fourth uh, body of information are these objects, most of them broken. Um, as you can see, when uh, Zev, you gave your talk, and I was like, I'm so excited by all the broken things. <laughs> Love them. Um, these objects over time, the core of my project about ancient Maya interactions with sculptures over the course of their life histories. And what I'm thinking now is that the first three bodies of information support our understanding of objects over time because they demonstrate the specificity with which Maya scribes and rulers engaged with their histories and allow us to hypothesize an analogous specificity in the engagement with stone <coughs> sculptures, together indicating the importance that ancient Maya placed on what we might call historical materiality. Now this research suggests the ancient Maya made and retained connections among rulers' bodies and sculptures. And specific actions, whether reverential or desecratory, were carried out on things because of who or what they portrayed or narrated. Also, the ancient Maya handled older <clears throat> objects as a way of coming into contact with or reshaping the past and history both to present historical narratives and to situate a person in the present in relation to the past. Sculptures also remained associated with individuals and were modified in ways that honored, shamed, or reclaimed their memory. So let me give uh, some more specific examples of um, the range of interactions, uh, which includes leaving sculptures standing in place, moving them to new locations, breaking, and reuse. Um, my first book about Piedra Stegris actually was supposed to be a chapter in this book on leaving sculpture standing, but I realized it was more than just a chapter because there was so much more going on, and that became its own book. Um, so today I want to focus just a bit on the breaking and reuse. And the different kinds of breaking are related to transformation, violence, and renewal not all of which I can address today. Um, 
But let me begin with this transformative breaking. Now, for many sculptures with carved portraits, there was pecking and chipping of the eyes, noses, or mouths. This was not a wholesale destruction of the face, but was focused on sensory organs, likely to stop them from seeing or breathing, as other scholars have proposed. All evidence points this to being reverential, enacted upon the portrayed ruler's death. This pecking was an action to transform the monument, to change its status, either to stop a vital image from seeing or breathing, or mark a transition to an ancestor, or both. Either way, the marked monument was left standing, and pecks and chips were material markers of memory, an index of engagement that signaled <coughs> the change of a person from and monument into an ancestor. Now, other types of objects were minimally modified, too. Many ceramic plates, such as this one, bowls and jugs were drilled or punched, or the feet of plates were knocked off before they were buried in tombs and, or offered in caches, caves, or water. These modifications appear to be part of a process of transformation before offering, in which they are physically changed to mark an ontological change, perhaps to liberate the essence of a thing or send it to deities or ancestors. Buildings also could be modified before burial by another building. For example, door lintels were often broken or the faces of plaster sculptures uh, were hit as on the sun god face from El Sotz. And here you can see this um, damage or change. Um, and thanks to Stephen Houston for providing this wonderful uh, uh, 3D scan at the last minute. Mm -hmm. Other objects were smashed before burial or offering. For example, jades were smashed or burned for offering caches at Copan or before being tossed in the waters of the Chichen Itza cenote. And this one over here was in New York last year as part of the Golden Humans exhibition. Also, ceramics were smashed or burned for offerings in Tikal temples, including around Tikal Stila 31, which I've showed a few times. <coughs> Evidence points to this smashing being reverential too, um, as part of offerings, to transform them for offerings. Now, what's different for the minimally modified stone sculptures, though, is that they remain standing and on view, and later sculptures emulated their images and were oriented toward them as successive dynasts established themselves in relation to their ancestors, a topic I explored in my book on Piedras Negras sculpture. But differing from those reverential actions, was desecratory smashing, done in warfare or regime change. For these, um, commonly the portrayed person's head, generally a ruler, was targeted first, often followed by further breaking. In multiple examples, only the bottoms of relief carved steely and three-dimensional sculptures survive. And so here, for this Tikal monument, these are the legs of a ruler. The full top has been broken off. Also a Tikal, these are just the legs with a captive underneath. Top's gone. Ombre de Tikal is missing his head. Here's another one from Yashilan with just the bottom legs. Here's one from Piedro Snegras with the head lopped off. And monuments like Pomonastila Seven suffered clear blows to the face. And here's where the face should be. Um, but also notice that the groin was mm -hmm. smashed too. Such smashing often can be correlated with inscriptions about warfare or regime change. And um, in some cases, there is a link between an attack on a monument portraying a ruler and his capture or assassination indicating a perceived connection between the monument and the ruler's body. In some cases, the smashed monuments were left they, where they were strewn. And I'm actually cheating a little bit here because this is a photograph. Um, the monument was actually taken on the ground and it cut 
it out. You can see the grass here. I've stood it up again for this picture. Um, because those cities were abandoned soon after the smashing during the late classic Maya collapse. But, the, but Maya people in earlier centuries also retrieved or rescued items that had been smashed and reused or reshaped them. Some fragments were recarved, though I won't talk about those today. The ones I want to focus on are the fragments that were moved to new locations, uh, primarily buried or put in shrines. Now, archaeologists found the broken Pomonastila 7 buried in the center of a building and covered with flat stones, buried as if a human body. I see no erosion on the stela, and this and other evidence suggests it was buried soon after it was broken to rescue and properly bury it. And we see this happening over longer expanses of time too. Tikal stela 39, again, hopefully you can see the legs here, with feet in profile. Um, I didn't include the drawings because I wanted to sort of, didn't want to mediate with the object themselves. Um, so Tikal Stila 39 is a fourth century monument from a king who appears to have been assassinated when Teotihuacan affiliated warriors took over Tikal in the late fourth century. Now, several centuries later, the bottom fragment was put in a temple shrine, right here, where people made offerings to it. The archaeologists note the shrine was above a tomb, right here, um, that may have been the same as the portrayed king from this monument. It thus appears that the recovery of the monument was also a recovery of memory to rescue the king's monument and make offerings to it and him. The fifth century Tikal Stila 31 was put in a temple shrine too. And here we are in the building where it was buried. There's the shrine. And here is a close up um, from the early, about 1963 after it was discovered. But this one was planted in the floor. It was reset anew, and it was absolutely, we know for sure, above the tomb of the portrayed ruler, buried in an earlier version of the building, where it was the recipient, uh, in the shrine, it was the recipient of offerings before being buried by another version of the building. So this layering of buildings and layerings of connections between this monument and the ancestor. Now that these shrines were venerated in shrines, that these sculptures were venerated in shrines or buried in places where the portrayed ruler had been interred indicates a continuing connection between monuments and rulers. But the reuse was also about the present, apparently part of renewing the city and dynasty after recovering from a crippling defeat and over a century without erecting any new monuments. This recovery is recounted in inscriptions and uh, referenced in that wooden lintel that I showed you before of that, the 260 year um, victory, victory after 260 years. They thus reshaped and reframed the past through objects and inscriptions to show recovery and continuity with powerful ancestors. But in these cases, ceremonial interaction with monuments in the shrines actually damaged them further. Here you can see the burning at the bottom of this stela. And I want to show you one example from Washaktun, which is uh, just north of Tikal. We actually have um, several sculptures from Washaktun that were put in shrines or buried. But I want to show you this one partly because there's not much to see. Okay. Uh, because the, it originally had um, a ruler on the front carved in relief, this was the front, but it's basically gone now uh, because of erosion and also because of burning. And you can see some blackening on the monument here from uh, when it was discovered in the 1930s. Uh, so this was Stila 22 um, from the early 6th century, uh, found by archaeologists um, in a shrine. And um, 
It had that human figure uh, carved on the front, and you can see the text, which is actually very well preserved, um, included a reference to the momentous fourth century arrival of Teotihuacan warriors. And this is a theme that actually keeps coming up with the moving around of these monuments. A lot of them have to do something with um, Teotihuacan. And um, this one had been erected above a tomb that we don't know whose, um, and on this platform. And this shrine was built around it. So here, um, I don't think we know, we can't tell if the monument was moved, but the shrine was built around it as this platform was changed over the centuries. And here in this wonderful rendering by Tatiana Proskuryakov, um, this little square rectangle here marks the roof of this building that I'm showing you, in which buildings were built around it such that you could no longer see it from the plaza. It was inaccessible, reduced accessibility, um, and which is especially important because these were originally public monuments, but we often have this sort of reduction of accessibility and visibility um, for these older monuments that were put in shrines. And um, the stela, I'll just jump back here a second, stood just a few centimeters from the back wall where its image and text were hardly visible or legible. <coughs> and with the fire offerings made to it, the burning damaged the image. The ceremonial interaction was more important than preserving carved information, although that was important in its placement in this location. So such enshrinement with reduced access, I think, functioned as a type of framing and marking of objects as changed and different, much as the Teotihuacan historical style does in the image I showed earlier. In these cases and others, we see this layering of engagements, some occluding or obliterating earlier histories, other indice, earlier indices of interaction, not to mention the original carvings. And we can often trace the histories, but we also have to acknowledge the limits of our knowledge and interpretation. And let me show you some examples that bring those limits into relief. The artifacts called miscellaneous sculptured stones, or MSS, um, this is the you know, wonderful names by the archeologists. Um, they're pieces that the archeologists of the T-Call project, Penn Museum from the 1960s, could discern were once finely carved monuments, uh, but the breakage was so thorough that they could not determine whether they had been steely altars or other sculpted forms. Um, and here, this is by photo, which I'm actually showing the backs that have these little dots that have been put on them. Um, there are slight, slight carvings on the other sides. Um, that they were once something is clear for, uh, many of them are finely carved or made with fine limestone used for uh, these kinds of sculptures. So MSS2 is a piece of glyph that you can see right here or MSS9 are this collection of small stone fragments. They are obliterated, changed from once they were once made to be, but they were transformed into something else because they were buried in offering caches, inside buildings or underneath newer sculptures. Undoubtedly, there were multiple engagements with these monuments that we can no longer see. And these are really show where our limits of knowledge, data, and interpretation become abundantly clear. Um, but they are prime examples to show that such sculptures were handled multiple times, that engaging with them over time was an essential aspect of their meaning, and that they could be valued even after they were smashed <coughs> so completely, suggesting there was memory about what they once were, whether or not there remained specificity in that memory. Now these are extremes, and I do not claim a possible recovery of who or what they were, 
why they were smashed or even how many times they were smashed, or what decisions went into their offerings in caches. Did that matter to the people who buried them and handled them in antiquity? I do not know. Yet, these extremes do not take away from the many other cases in which fragments remained tethered to the rulers who dedicated them or were portrayed on them when later people handled, moved, reset, and made offerings to them as ways to honor ancestors, connect themselves to their legacy, and renew the power and continuity of their polity. These were objects of the past, but they were very much of the present too, brought back and set against and into the present, much like ceremonies that conjured ancestors into ritual spaces or images that portrayed ancestors in the present to emphasize the juxtaposition and layering of people and events across time. Now, I also want to mention that I don't see these engagements as ending in the ninth century, for part of the project also looks to modern engagements with monuments, ranging from uh, what Maya communities are doing to archeologists um, to the New York art market. And this monument here um, is actually in Dallas. Um, and the archeologists think they may have found the back of the monument that was um, cut off of it in the 1960s when it was looted. Um, because these monuments endure through time and continue to be handled and understood in relation to their past and present. So I hope I've given you an idea of the richness of this material, uh, much of the progress I've made, as well as some of the methodological questions I am still grappling with. I look forward to any of your comments. Um, thank you very much. Jeffrey. Thank you, that was super interesting. Um, and I think it dovetails with a lot of interest that, that I know a number of us in the room have. Um, I, the one sort of, as I was listening to you, I, I, I felt like there was a, a language that was kind of not, that you chose not to use, or at least I didn't hear. Maybe you can agree or disagree, but I didn't hear a lot of sort of explicitly anthropological mm -hmm. terminology or theorization, nor did I hear um, what would seem to be one potential move, which would be cross-cultural mm -hmm. um, comparisons to see, you know, is there, are there theories about how images are treated, you know, mm -hmm. generally? And I'm just thinking even of people who've started to write books about, you know, agency and things of statues in the Western culture, and I think are explicitly engage it, you know, looking outside the West to try to understand, well, actually, are we just doing the same things that, that other peoples have long done? So yeah. what is your what is your thought yeah. about that? Are you using that or using not to, or did you use it and I just didn't hear? It? Um, I didn't use it now because I was just wanting to you know, present as much as I could in a short period of time. It's not a criticism. I'm just no, 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 I totally get it. Um, no, and actually, um, those are, are, are absolutely part of um, cross-cultural comparisons. And, and part of this project was um, um, there are reasons not enriched. To do that. <laughs> no, 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 absolutely. Um, so um, I was part of a research network in England called the Iconoclasms Research Network, and which, you know, let's see, 10 years ago, I would say, I don't work on iconoclasm. And then I realized, wait a minute, I do. Maybe we just need to talk about it differently. Um, and, and so that's where sort of thinking about breaking for transformation versus breaking for desecration mm -hmm. or something like that. And the problem with using that yeah. term, borrowing it from an existing Absolutely. network, is that yeah. it brings in other things that maybe don't apply to your case, and you don't want those. I'm Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. So, so those have um, that... Your thinking cross cultural has helped a lot, but at the same time, to keep that tension in the dialogue of not getting too far away from the materials that we do have and what we do see, um, and then of course um, the you know questions of agency and the monuments and those anthropological texts um, also are a really important part of this project and. I um, haven't written that part yet, that um, 
and still, you know, sort of questions of organization um, have written, you know, a little bit here and there of does it happen just in the introduction or methodology or how do I weave that into um, the text? But yes, absolutely. And it's not because I'm not thinking about it, um, but because either there was no time or I'm not quite there yet. Yeah, that answers your question. I have a follow-up question. Thanks, yeah. Megan, that was really interesting. Um, I want to ask you about a very colloquial term that you used, which was damage. I feel like I'm channeling yes. our absent colleague here a little bit. Um, because I'm yep. sure he would ask a version of this question. And um, especially with your one example um, where the surface imagery was worn out by later yes. um, ritual offerings and burnings. And um, g given your sensitivity to Mayan <laughs> conceptions, not only of sort of history and temporality, but of what kinds of um, enactments these might be. Do we even need to avoid using the word damage? Mm -hmm. I mean, on the one hand, maybe the imagery is disappeared, yeah. but the object is something else. I don't know what the I don't know what it is. The something else. That's like that's the question. Is it enlivened? Is it enact? Is it enacted? Is it you know what? <laughs> You know, can, how can we avoid? How can we avoid both our own sort of Western and presentist yeah. connotations with the term yeah. "damage" in talking about the physical alterations? No, you're absolutely right, and I think um, that when I say "just modified" is a way of just getting at that, or when I um, showed one of the masks from this incredible temple uh, from El Sotz, um, I think when I was Working on this yesterday, I had, it was <coughs> damaged, and then I said, wait a minute, let's just say hit, right? How do we yeah. um, avoid that um, implying that something's wrong or something is damaged? Um, you know, and maybe I use damage just as another synonym, but I think you're absolutely right that, because it's, it is a part, I don't know what happened. Um, oh, wow. wow. Like, not my Talk about history. Yeah. There we go. Uh, that that it's a it's a part of using them in ways that I still don't know that they were meant to be used, right? Because I think that they were originally envisioned as like you make one and you expect it to be there for all time in a way. Yeah. And then these things happen. And, um, and, and, and I very specifically do not use damage to the pecking of the faces because it is a pattern, it's a widespread pattern. Um, but, and then this burning as well. The burning generally doesn't happen if it stays on view where it originally was. You see this burning once they're in a room. Um, whether they've been moved to a room or built around it. So um, so I agree that that's a problem, and I will pay attention to that. D does, yeah. it al does it also bring up the, the need to differentiate um, object, image, and inscription? I mean, we, we, we inherit a single thing that has all three of these components, but it seems like the, they're each doing something differently. So in, this, in that one case... You know, the inscription is maintained, the image is not, but does the, does the stuff of yeah. the stone have its own properties and livelihoods that are being engaged with outside of image and inscription? Yeah, well, yes, I think so. And, and the uh, one part that I didn't mention, again, there's so much complexity and wonderful complexity of this material, that um, so... Um, there is evidence that there, uh, the stone was valued for being stone. We either are um, inscriptions, or sorry, monuments that are images of stone, that are images of mountains that are alive. Mm -hmm. So that have faces, that breathe, and that these stones come from that animate material and carry that with them. Um, so you have that, and then you also have the uh, carving of the ruler on it, the dedication ceremony 
that these are all this sort of layering of potency to these monuments. And I've tried to sort of extricate, like, where does the power come from? Is it from the stone? Is it from the image? Is it from the ruler? And I can't, right? I, I don't even know, however hard I try. Um, and I think that um, maybe we can't. Now, there are examples of inscriptions that are damaged. I didn't show one. or modified, though I think that some of those are damaged. There's one uh, wonderful, very clear case from Copan in which one glyph has been chipped <coughs> right off and everything else left. And David Stewart thinks that it was the name of a king um, and who was being sort of erased from memory. So we um, do have those examples as well. So I, I don't know if you're... Um, asking me if, if it's um, by trying to separate the text and image object, am I missing something? No, or no, no I'm, it's I'm, I'm just wondering whether they're, they don't operate um, different, uh, differently, that they're, they serve different, mm -hmm. they, they're, they're each functional, but in not, not the same ways, so that, yeah. I, I mean, it, just might, right. it might help create a basis for thinking about the active verbs that we're using mm -hmm. to think about what's happening to each of those different components of you know, of the bounded objects as we inherit it. Yeah, absolutely. And and this is a really good example. I didn't talk about it much. <laughs> just used it because it's a great picture. Uh, because soon after this photograph was taken, they consolidated the monument and filled in all the holes. And that's how we see it today. Um, but here, um, this was uh, a Piedra Snegris panel. It's about this big. Um, smashed in warfare, we think, the same one that lopped off the ruler's head. Um, but what's so interesting is that every single head was knocked off of here, but the text is surprisingly intact. Mm -hmm. So that there were decisions about um, even in, you know, whether uh, the heat of battle or probably after um, when these were sort of systematically um, smashed. So there was, there was different attention to images versus um, text and then to the whole monuments themselves. Thanks. Thanks, Megan. It was a really interesting talk. You've talked about what we, would, what we might describe as kind of malevolent interventions. Can you talk about the evidence for beneficial interventions? Well, I mean, I are think... Are they reworking these, these statues in an artistic, what we might say, think of as, as an artistic way, and therefore they're invisible to us or not so necessarily readable to us? Or does the only intervention come in this kind of malevolent moment, whether you want to use that word? Well, I mean, I think that the, let's say, where is one of them? The pecking is benevolent. Um, it's a part of a transformation that... Um, is not damage mm -hmm. that um, so I, I yeah I think absolutely that this was a benevolent action. But they're but, not restoring um, them. That's another. Well, thing. okay. So uh, Yashilan Steel of Six mm -hmm. uh, was recarved with an image mm -hmm. um, that um, David Stewart again, amazing mm -hmm. epigrapher, um, thinks may have been um, abraded in. Uh, possibly warfare, but mm -hmm. I'm not quite sure there, mm -hmm. but recart mm -hmm. as an image. Mm -hmm. um, so we do have that, um, or we have examples um, uh, that um, there's a stela from a site near uh, Tikal mm -hmm. that had its head got knocked off mm -hmm. at some point, and then that head was recarved into an altar and placed in front of it. So mm -hmm. then you have the stela altar pair. Mm -hmm. uh, what's really strange is that you then have this headless figure along with the altar, but it was, um, uh, I mean, probably that happened one, um, uh, Simon Martin thinks that that monument may have been exiled uh, from Tikal um, during this um, uh, fourth century um, invasion, perhaps, from uh, Teotihuacan. And so then they had this monument that they wanted to use, and so recarving it into something new that um, otherwise that, that site didn't have. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your 
question. Yeah, and I'm wondering yeah. that how does that change your question, your question, mm -hmm. when you add those monuments in? Uh, well, those are all, yeah, I mean, so there is when we do have um, a possible disconnection mm -hmm. of the individual who is there. Mm -hmm. um, though, um, from a subsidiary site that um, is interested in this connection with Tikal. Mm -hmm. so, mm -hmm. so you have these other um, actions at play. Mm -hmm. and, and, and that's something that, and I fully acknowledge that um, we can't know <coughs> the decisions that were made. Um, but trying to make these connections mm -hmm. of when can we say, yes, this seems to have been tethered mm -hmm. to that person, mm -hmm. or when we just don't know. Yeah, so um, it was really super interesting. Um, this is a question that comes out of sheer ignorance. Um, but are there textual sources that open any kind of change to monuments or um, sort of texts like this? No, unfortunately not. So um, in this region, um, most of um, all perishable materials are gone because it's half wet and half dry. Right, I understand so, not so, like paper text, yeah. but but you know inscriptions on on other monuments that might say that might explain that something. I restored yeah. this. Yeah, or something, something like that you no, find. No, we don't have that. So we have uh, signatures of making. So uh, from a painter or from a sculptor when something was made and those um, dedication statements when things were made. Um, there are references um, to at um, Palenque, which I didn't talk about. There are some texts that they say there was a period after warfare in which no monuments were erected. It, or it's more about no calendar rites were celebrated. So you have this idea of the importance of this regular commemoration, which generally involved. Um, but we don't have anything that says um, this, you know, why things were recarved or remade. Um, we do have uh, from Barbara's area, from central Mexico, Aztec, later material. Um, we know that, um, well, we have 16th century texts um, after the Spanish arrived um, that talk about renewal ceremonies in which everything was smashed mm -hmm. and then thrown into the water or mm -hmm. other places. And so um, that happened, for example, every 52 years on these uh -huh. major calendar events. Um, and so we may have some of that with mm -hmm. the, um, when we see, um, uh, broken things um, mm -hmm. as offerings, but otherwise, um, I don't. I'm not yeah. thinking of anything and, in and particular. I, I know that in some of these places, there's still very um, sort of powerful local traditions that are linked to, you know, the ancient period, mm -hmm. whether it's invented or not. But whether or not there's that those shed any light on, or whether you can sort of read back using how people think about objects now. Yeah. Could be transferred to Christian context. You yeah. Might, yeah. Know, but I mean, that might also be a methodological point you don't want to do. Right, yeah. right. So, so no, um, I mean, I think with um, how things were used, um, uh, dedication ceremonies, absolutely, um, especially from, um, we have 16th century sources as well as some really good 19th century sources that talk about um, La Candon Maya um, in Chiapas and their um, making of what they call these god pots, um, which are um, ceramic vessels that um, are the, the gods sort of live inside of them. That's not explaining it very well. Um, but they have to remake them every certain um, a certain periods of time. And the older ones, they'll take actually a stone from that had been, sometimes I'll actually take stones from the archeological sites or the places mm -hmm. of their ancestors as they talk about them and put them into those God pots. And then that has to be moved 
to the new pot, and the old one is <coughs> um, can be smashed or put into a cave that has to be sort of taken away from the site. So, <coughs> so those kinds of issues about um, dedication ceremonies, about um, <coughs> taking things away after they've been used, um, have are absolutely a part of how I'm. I'm thinking about this. <coughs> yeah. Thanks. So sorry. That's okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's super interesting. Oh, yeah. it, it, thank you for that. Uh, it says that all of the questions you're getting are about language in the end of the day. Uh -huh. And I wonder if even in the vocabulary <coughs> of the script or the language you're working with, the word smashing or decapitation yeah. or destroying actually mm -hmm. exists. And whether you, in order to actually understand what's going on with this sculptural enterprises you that is to say the combination of image and text you actually have to go to the very basic vocabulary and see how that vocabulary is used in other contexts in order to understand if this is actually because it seems that you're basically projecting a very long a very well established both scholarly and non-scholarly western tradition regarding what a missing nose means and throughout you know everywhere miss a missing nose or a decapitated face is, is means one thing and it's usually violence, right? But it seems that in your story it's not necessarily violent. Then the question is if you go, if, if you don't really have to go all the way down to the very basic vocabulary and see how those terms used, if they actually exist, and it could be that they don't exist, and then the question is what does it actually mean if they don't exist? Yeah, so um, there's some very good writing about the, the smash noses um, that actually does use um, Maya writing and images. Um, there's a, a book called uh, Memory of Bones um, by Houston, Stewart, and Tauba. Um, and they're uh, thinking about their images with breath that uh, when a bead is shown in front of the nose and the um, words for one of the phrases for death is that the breath was, basically the breath is extinguished. Right, so, so that, um, I didn't mention it here because I didn't want to go into the details, but absolutely, there are other people, and I'm thinking about it too, about this um, extinguishing of breath of a body as well as of these monuments. Now, thinking about uh, the monuments themselves, or the large stones, if we want to use their phrase, um, the words that were used for the dedications um, were often planted, sap, uh, or wa stood up. So, and um, terms for warfare can be to, um, basically to put, put down or fall down. So um, there is this idea of the, the standing up of things and then the knocking them down as part of either dedication or um, what happens in warfare. So um, I think you're right that it would, um, so for the, you know, published version of this book, mm -hmm. um, to do a little bit more with, um, with those uh, words that we have, either from the, you know, fourth to eighth century inscriptions or from dictionaries that we have in mm -hmm. the 16th century or later. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Do we still have time? Um, just, you mentioned how important time was in the conception of those monuments. And you mentioned sort of various cons um, registers of time, um, long-term long memory, um, a, B, a series, B series, and so on. Is there also a way of understanding how uh, the monuments themselves created their conditions of um, reception and how, how the viewing itself was conceptualized as a, as a moment in time? I mean, you, some some of these uh, some of the examples you showed seem to be um, ex extremely saturated with with both inscriptions and images, and seem to imply a very slow kind of viewing. Yeah. Um, is there something? So um, one, let me see if I can find it. This one. So one thing that um, I talk about in my book on the Piedras Negras monuments is that in order to read the text, this one doesn't have a good example, but to if you were to read the text, um, probably in a performance in which it's recited, um, 
because literacy was low, you actually have to move around the monuments. Uh, you have to circumambulate them, um, which we know both from ancient colonial <coughs> period and contemporary as important Maya ritual practice, circumambulation. So that this movement, um, so seeing and viewing was a way, was also a ritual practice or could be a ritual practice. Um, and also with the way that, and the reason that I brought this one up is here you have um, the mother standing in front of the ruler seated in the front. And um, what's really interesting about Piedras Negras is that you have these series of monuments by different rulers who are descendants of each other. Um, and the first one you get just has the ruler seated in the niche. Um, the next generation, I think it's again just the ruler sitting, sitting in the niche. Then you have people on the sides of the monument looking. And then for this one, you have the mother in front looking. And I do think that these are showing ways that people experience these monuments. Um, looking at them, witnessing as and seeing as important um, uh, ways of um, experiencing them, which also do come from the inscriptions as well, words for witnessing and seeing um, that are important parts. So um, I don't know if that quite answers your question, yeah. but yeah, absolutely. With um, they, they do have these um, elements that show how they were or indicate how they may have been seen or experienced. So I think we need to... Uh stop here formally for reasons of time, uh, but we can continue informally, uh, but first a little thank you.